Hello, everybody. Welcome to VeeamON 2022, the live version. Yes, we're finally back live. Last time we did VeeamON was 2019 live. Of course, we did two subsequent years uh, virtual. My name is Dave Vellante. And we've got two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of VeeamON. As usual, Veeam has brought together a number of customers, but it's really doing something different this year, like many uh, companies that you see. They have a big hybrid event. It's close to 40,000 people online, and that's sort of driving the actual program where the content is actually different for the, the, the virtual viewers versus the on-site. On-site, there's the, the VIP event going on. They got the keynotes. Veeam is a company whose ascendancy occurred during the, the VMware rise. They brought in a new way of doing data protection. They didn't use agents. They, they protected at the hypervisor level. That changed the way that people did things. They're now doing it again in cloud, in SaaS, in containers, and ransomware. And so we're going to dig into that. My co-host is Dave Nicholson this week, and we've got a special guest, Zias Caravalla, who is the principal at ZK Research. He's a, an extraordinary analyst. Zias, great to see you. David, thanks for coming out. Absolutely, good to see you. Veeamon. Great to be here. Yeah, we've done Veeamon. Back now, live. Things have changed so dramatically. Uh, I mean, the focus, ransomware, it's now a whole new TAM, uh, the adjacency to security, data protection. It's just a, Zeus, it's a whole new ball game, isn't it? Well, it is, and, and in fact, um, during the keynote, they, they mentioned that they've, they're now tied at number one in, for you know, backup and recovery, which is, I think, it's safe to say Veeam does that really well. I think from and a- That's tied with Dell, yes? Right. They didn't, I don't think they mentioned Dell that as a keynote, yeah. but yeah. And, uh, but I, you know, they've been rising, Dell EMC's been falling, and so I think Somebody it's, said 10 points that, that Dell lost in sharing the yeah, IDC it's not, data. It's not a big surprise. I mean, they, wow. they haven't really invested a whole lot, I think. Uh -huh. that. Anyway, so I Anyways, interrupt. but I think from a Veeam perspective, the question is, now that they've kind of hit that number one spot or close to it, what do they do next? This company they mentioned, I was talking to the CTO yesterday, he mentioned they're holding an exabyte of customer data. That is a lot of data, right? And so they, they do backup and recovery really well. They do it arguably better than anybody. And so how do they take that data and then move into other adjacent markets to go create not just a backup and recovery company, but a true data management platform company that has relevancy in cyber and analytics and artificial intelligence and data warehousing, right? All those other areas, I think, are, are really open territory for this company right now. You know, Dave, you were a, a CTO at, at EMC when you, and you saw a lot of the acquisitions that the company made. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, they really never had a singular focus on data protection. They had a big data protection business, but that's the differentiator with Veeam. That's all it does, and you see that shine through. From a, from a CTO's perspective, how do you see this market changing, evolving, and what's your sense as to how Veeam is doing here? I think a lot of it's being driven by kind of, uh, unfortunately, evil genius uh, out in the market space. Yeah. I know we're going to be hearing a lot about ransomware, uh, a lot about some concepts that we didn't really talk about outside of maybe the defense industry, air gapping, logical air gapping. Um, Zeus, you mentioned you know, this, uh, this this question of what do you do when you have so many petabytes of data under management. Exabytes now. Exabytes, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, see there, I'm, I'm already falling behind. Yeah. One thing you could do is you could encrypt it all and then ask for Bitcoin in exchange for access to that data. Yes, that see, is see what happens. a lot see, of them. See, we're, we're, getting, we're getting so much of the evil genius stuff headed our way, you start, th you start thinking in those ways. But yeah, to, to your point, uh, dedicated backup products don't address the scale and scope and variety of threats, not just from operational uh, uh, you know, mishaps, uh, but now from so many bad actors coming in from the outside, it, it's a whole new world. See, as, as analysts, we get inundated with ransomware solutions. Everybody's talking oh, about yeah. it across the spectrum. The thing that interested me about what's happening here at VeeamON is they're, they're sort of trotting out this study that they do. Veeam does some serious research you know, thousands of customers that got hit by ransomware that they dug into, and then a, a larger study of all companies, many of whom didn't realize or said they hadn't been hit by ransomware, but they're really trying to inject thought leadership into the equation. You saw some of that in the analyst session this morning. It's now public, uh, so we can talk about it. What were your thoughts on that data? 
Yeah, that was uh, really fascinating data because it shows the ransomware industry, the response to it is largely reactive, right? We wait to get breach, we wait to, to, uh, to get held at ransom, I suppose, and then we a lot of companies paid out. In fact, I talked to this one hospital in Florida, they're buying lots and lots of Bitcoin simply to pay out ransomware attacks. They don't even really argue with them, they just pay it out. And I think Veeam's trying to change that mentality a little bit. You know, if you have the right strategy in place to be more preventative, you can do that, you can protect your data and then restore it right when you want to, so you don't have to be in that big bucket of companies that frankly pay and actually don't get their data back. Right? And, like a third, I yes, think, roughly. It's a shocking amount of companies that get hit by that, and for a lot of companies, that's the end of their business. You know, and a lot of the recovery process is manual. Is again, the technologist, you understand that that's not the ideal way to go. In fact, it's probably a, a way to fail. Well, recovery is always the problem. When I was in corporate IT, I used to joke that we were the best at backup, terrible at recovery. And well, you that's, know, that's not atypical. My friend, Fred Moore, who was the vice president of strategy at a company called Storage Tech, Storage Technology Corporation, I remember Storage Tech. he had a great uh, saying. He said, backup is one thing, recovery is everything. And he started, he said that 30 years ago. <laughs> but, but orchestration and automating that orchestration is, is really vital. We saw in the study a lot of organizations are using scripts. And scripts are fragile, you know, they break, right? Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Unfortunately, the idea of the red run book on the shelf is still with us. Uh, uh, you know, scripting does not equal automation necessarily in every case. There's still going to be a lot of manual steps in the process. Um, but you know, what I hope we get to talk about during the next couple of days is you know, some of the factors that go into this. We've got day zero exploits that have already been uncovered that are stockpiled uh, and tucked away, and it's inevitable that they're going to hit. Yeah. So whether it's a manual recovery process or some level of automation, um, if you don't have something that is air-gapped and cut off from the rest of the world in a physical or logical way, you can't guarantee that. The, the, pro the problem with manual that. processes and scripting is even if you can set it up today, the environment changes so fast, right? And with shadow IT and business units buying their own services and users storing things and you know wherever. Um, you, you can't keep up with scripts and manual. Automation must be the way. And I've been, and I don't care what part of IT you work in, whether it's this area, networking, communications, whatever, automation must be the way. I think prior to the pandemic, I saw a lot of resistance from IT pros in the area of automation. Since the pandemic, I've seen a lot of warming up to it because I think IT pros now just realize they can't do their job without so, it. So, so you, don't, you don't think that edge devices uh, lend themselves to manual recovery? Yeah, no, processes? in fact, I think that's one of the things they didn't talk about. In the What's that? Is, is edge. Edge is going to be huge. More, every retailer I talk to, oil and gas companies have been using it for a long time. I've, you know, manufacturing organizations are looking at edge as a way to put more data in more places to improve experiences because you're moving the data closer, but we're creating a world where the fragmentation of data, you think it's bad now, just wait a couple of years until the edge is a little more you know, uh, to life here, and I think you ain't seen nothing yet. This, is, uh, th this world of data everywhere is truly becoming that, and the thing with edge is there's no one definition of edge. You got IoT edge, cellular edge, campus edge, right? Um, you know, you look at hotels, they have their own edge. I talked to Major League Baseball, right? They have, every stadium's got its own edge server in it. So we're moving into a world, we're putting more data in more places, it's more fragmented than ever, and we need better ways of managing, uh, of securing that data, but then also being able to recover for when things happen. I was happy that Danny Allen, he used the term that we coined called super cloud, he used that in the analyst meeting today, and, and, and that's a metaphor for this new layer of cloud that's developing, to your point, whether it's on-prem and a hybrid, across clouds, not just running on the cloud, but actually abstracting away the complexity of the underlying primitives and APIs, and then eventually, to your point, going out to the edge. I don't know of anyone who has an aggressive edge strategy. Veeam, to its credit, you know, has gone well beyond just virtualization. They've gone to bare metal, they're into cloud. They were Containers. the they were first at yeah. SaaS. They acquired yeah. Kasten, who was a partner of theirs, and they tried to acquire them earlier, but there was some government things and you know that whole thing. That got cleaned up, and now they they own Kasten, and I think the edge is next. I mean, it's got to be. There's going to be so much data at the edge. I guess the question is, where is it today? How much of that is actually persisted? How much goes back to the cloud? I don't think people really have a good answer for that yet. No, in fact, a lot of edge services will be very ephemeral in nature. So it's not like with cloud where we'll take data and we'll store it there forever. 
with the edge, we're going to take data, we'll store it there for the time, point in time we need it. But I think one of the interesting things about Veeam is because they're decoupled from the airline hardware, they can run virtual machines and containers, porting Veeam to whatever platform you have next actually isn't all that difficult, right? And so then if you need to be able to go back to a certain point in time, they can do that instantly. It's a, it's a fascinating way to do backup. It's so you, good point about it. I mean, yeah. you remember the signs up and down, you know, near the EMC facility right outside of South Road. No hardware agenda. That, that was yeah. Jeremy Burton when he was yeah. running Veritas. Of course, they've got a little hardware agenda. So, but Veeam doesn't. Veeam is, you know, they, they're friendly with all the hardware players, so pure play software. A couple other stats on them. So they're a billion dollar company. They've now started to talk about their ARR growth. They grew 27% uh, last year in, 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 in annual recurring revenue, 25% uh, uh, in the most recent quarter. And so they're, in, in the vast majority of their business is subscription. I think they said 73% uh, is now subscription based. So they really trans transition that business. The other thing about Veeam is they've, they've come up with a licensing model that's very friendly. Um, and they sort of remove that friction early on in the process. I remember talking to Ratmir about this. He said, we are going to incent our partners and make it transparent to them, whether it's, you know, that when we shift from, you know, the, 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 the crack of, of perpetual license to a subscription model, we're going to make that transparent to partners. We'll take care of that. Essentially, they funded that transition. So that's worked very well. So they do stand out, I think, from some of the larger companies that have these big portfolios. Although the big portfolio companies, you know, they get board level contacts and they can elbow their ways in. Your thoughts on that sort of selling dynamic? So navigating that transition to a subscription model is always fraught with danger. Everybody wants you to be there, but they want you to be there now. Mm -hmm. They don't like the transition that happens over 18, 24 months to get there. Um, As a private company, they're somewhat shielded from yeah. What they would have been if they were yeah, for sure. So yeah. ex ex exactly, yeah. but but that but that bodes well from a from a, a Veeam perspective. Um, the other interesting thing is that they sit where customers sit today, in the real world, a hybrid world. Not everything is in the cloud or a single cloud. Uh, still, a lot of on-prem things to take care of, and and there will the be idea. for a long time. Exactly. Yeah. Back to this idea. Yeah, there's a very long tail on that. So it's, it's, it's well enough to have a niche product that addresses a certain segment of the market, but to be able to go in and say, all data everywhere, it doesn't matter where it lives, we have you covered, um, that's a powerful message. And we were talking earlier, I think they, they stand a really good shot at taking market share on, you know, on an ongoing basis. Yeah, the interesting thing about this market, Dave, is they're, you know, although you know, they're tied number one with Dell now, they're, it's 12%, right? This reminds me of the security industry five, six years ago where it's so fragmented, there's so many vendors, no one really stood out, right? Then what happened in security? So a little company called Palo Alto Networks came around, they created a platform story, they moved into adjacent markets like SD-WAN, they did a lot of smart acquisitions, and they took off. I think Veeam is at that similar point, where they've now, you know, that 12% number, they've got some capital now, they could go do some acquisitions if they wanted to, there's lots of adjacent markets as they talk about. This company could be the Palo Alto of the data management market, if you know, and, and based on good execution, but there's certainly the opportunities there with all the data that they're holding. It's a really interesting point. I want to stay there in a second. So there's obviously there's there's backup, there's recovery, there's data protection, there's ransomware protection, there's SaaS data protection, and now all of a sudden you're seeing even a company like Rubrik is kind of repositioning as a security play, yeah. which. I'm not sure that's the right move for a company that's really been focused on, on backup to really dive into that fragmented market, but it's clearly an adjacency. And we heard Anand, the new CEO today in the analyst segment, you know, we asked him, what's your kind of legacy going to look like? And he said, I want to, I want to defragment this market. He's looking at, you know, he wants 25 to 45 percent of the market, which I think is really ambitious. I love that goal. Now, to your point, Big range. He, he, it, he's sure, but that doubles yeah. from today or more. And he gets there, to your point, possibly through acquisitions. They've made some really interesting tuck-ins with Kasten. They certainly bought an AWS uh, cloud play years ago. But my, my so uh, Veeam was purchased by uh, private equity, Inside Capital, Inside Capital. In, in January of 2020, just before COVID, for $5 billion. And at the time, then COVID hit right after, you were like, uh-oh. And then, of course, the market took off. So great acquisition by Insight. But, I think an IPO is in their future. And that's 
uh, Zeus when they can start picking up some of these adjacent markets oh, through M&A. And I think one of the challenges of them is now that the Holden is exabited data, they need to be able to tell customers things they, the customer doesn't know. Right, and that's where a lot of the work they're doing in artificial intelligence and machine learning comes into play, right? And, and nobody does that better than AWS, right? AWS is always looking at your data and telling you things you don't know, which makes you buy more. And so I think from a Veeam perspective, they need to now take all this, this huge asset they have and, and find a way to monetize it, and that's by revealing these key insights to customers that the customers don't even know they have. And they've got that monitor, monitoring layer. Um, it's, it, 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 he called it, Danny didn't like to use the term, but he called it an AI. It's really machine learning that monitors and then I think makes recommendations. I want to dig into that a little bit with well, him. You can see the platform story starting to build here, right? And These are really good point yeah. because they really have been historically a point product company. This notion of super cloud is really a platform play. Right, and if you look in the software industry, look across any, any segment of the software industry, those companies that were niche that became big became platforms. Salesforce, SAP, Oracle, right? And, and they find a way to allow others to build on their platform. You know, companies, you think of like a Citrix, they never did that. Yep. And they kind of tapered, you know, petered out at a certain level of growth and had to, you know, change. They're still changing their business model, in fact. But I think that's, Veeam's at that inflection point, right? They either build a platform story, enable others to do more on their platform, or they stagnate. HP Software is another good example. They never were able to get that platform. They were not they were able just to just a bunch of bespoke yeah. and on used to work there. Well, why is it so important, Dave, to have a platform over a product? Well, Cynical Dave says uh, you have a platform because it attracts investment and it makes you look cooler than maybe you really are. Uh, but, uh, but really for longevity, you have, you, you, you have to be a platform. So what's the difference? How do you, you know when you have a, platform like, versus awesome. APIs? Is it yeah. breadth? Is it you, ecosystem? Some of it is, a, some of it is semantics. Look, at when, when I'm worried about my critical assets, my data, um, I think of a platform, a portfolio of point solutions for backing up edge data, stuff that's in the cloud, stuff that exists in SaaS. I see that holistically and I think, guys, you're doing enough. This is good. Don't, don't dilute your efforts. Just keep focusing on making sure that you can back up my data wherever it lives and we'll both win together. So whenever I hear platform, I get a little bit, a little bit sketchy. Well, the platform beats products, doesn't it? Yeah, to me, it's yeah, yeah. the last word you said, ecosystem. Yes. When you think of the big platform players, everybody in the customer experience space builds, to, builds for Salesforce first. If you're a small security vendor, you build for Palo Alto first. Right. Right? If you're in the database, you build for Oracle first. And when you're that de facto platform, you create an ecosystem around you that you no longer have to fund and build yourself. It just becomes self-fulfilling, and that drives a level of stickiness that can't be replicated through product. Well, look at the ecosystem that, that these guys are forming. I mean, it's exactly. clear. Yeah. So are they becoming, in your view, a platform? I think they are becoming a platform, and I think that's one of the reasons they brought on and in. I think he's got some good experience doing that. You could argue that Ring kind of became that, right? The, when, you know, when he Ring was- Central, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so I think some, some of his experiences and then moving into adjacencies, I think, is really the reason they brought him in to lead this company to the next level. Excellent. Guys, thanks yeah. so much for setting up Veeam 2022. Two days of coverage on theCUBE. We're here at the Aria. It's a, it's a great venue. I love the Aria. Yeah, it's it nice. It's a nice, intimate spot. A lot of customers here. Of course, there's going to be a big Veeam party. They're famous for their parties, but uh, we'll, we'll be here to cover it. And uh, keep it right there. We'll be back with the next segment. You're watching theCUBE at Veeam 2022 from Las Vegas.